What's up, Glowfly gimmicks? I'm Quackers Co., and this is the fish fry for November 17th, being held at Sockeye Station. Our cooking utensils for this rotation is the splatter shot, the Splatana wiper, the blaster, and the tent umbrella. You never know what Wave 1 is going to give you in Salmon Run, so you might as well paint as much as you can in preparation for the worst. And once the Sockeye Station is painted, it becomes a blast with so much space to use all of our different movement capabilities. And just like normal, we gotta expect the worst to come from that shoreline as well. We never know what it's going to be. So even just a little bit of extra ink on the turf will help give us just a little bit more of an advantage on our bosses. And with the mid-range of this composition, get used to going in, causing that damage or getting an egg, and painting your way out immediately. And don't forget to keep an eye on what your teammates are doing and how you can assist them. It never felt like all seems lost on Sakai Station. That tower gives you so many different ways of having an exit strategy, no matter what tide you're on. And also, fish sticks are always a high priority, no matter what tide you're on, on Sakai Station. And with the range of this composition, one helpful thing to remember is that your bomb throw can go just a little bit further than what we have. And think about what this range is going to be like on a low tide. There's going to be moments where we're going to have to get close to shoreline bosses, but we have so many different exit strategies that we have out here. So cut those corners. On a fog, one of the hardest bosses to spot is a drizzler. So if you happen to see one, don't forget to put a little bit more of a higher priority on it. Two or three drizzler balloons won't just take out your mobility, they'll just splat you. On a Glowflies wave, we'll need all hands on deck to maintain that line of damage. No matter which area your coworkers are trying to survive in, just always try to make sure you pay attention to which side those salmonids are coming from and how you can provide the most amount of damage to the horde. Remember, you can open up that umbrella without sending it to have a temporary shield to splat those chum and cause some damage to that goldie. The same idea of survival works with the Griller's Wave as well. The Splatter Shot and the Splatana should be on small fry control, though. Lesser control will be a little bit of an issue with this composition, so on a giant tornado, try to stay as a group and cause as much damage to those lessers as they're dropping. And don't forget to throw the eggs in a straight line. You can easily just jump over the water and take a little bit of a shortcut to make the egg throwing process a little bit shorter. On a Mudmouth Wave, we still have that same issue with lesser control. Try to make sure you take out those Mudmouths as quick as possible, whilst also maintaining lesser control. The Splattershot and the Splatana definitely have the most mobility, so on a Quahawk charge, try to make sure you're running eggs. The range of this composition also makes Mothership just a little bit difficult. Make sure you keep your movement fresh on the map, keeping an eye on where those boxes are landing, and especially an eye towards the basket for that Chinook that will land right there by it. Don't forget to focus everybody's damage right there on the Mothership as it lands. A Goldie Seek at Sockeye Station can actually be really easy. If you're on a high tide Goldie Seek, there's three valves that are around the basket. If any of those are low, then it'll be the valve on the double platform, and vice versa. On a regular tide, if the three valves on the shoreline are short, then you know it's going to be the valve by the basket. And with all the space and the levels here at Sockeye Station, there's a lot of opportunities to get ourselves some safety, take a moment to breathe and get our ink back, and totally clutch it for our teammates. All right, let's get into the cookware. Our first cooking utensil is the splatter shot. 
The splatter shot has the best coverage in the kit, but remember it doesn't have exactly a really good damage output. It does have some pretty good range to it, so always try to maintain a little bit of distance between you and your enemies. This weapon can be played aggressive, just try to be smart about it. Every weapon in this composition is really good for taking out fish sticks and stingers, but the splatter shot and the splatana should make them their priority targets. Our second cooking utensil is the Spatana Wiper. Here's a good tip for the Spatana Wiper if you have problems with that forward dash taking you too close to the enemies. As long as you jump when you fire that charge shot, you won't dash forward, and also gives you just a little bit more range on higher targets. So just like some of the blasters, this weapon does a really good job with swimming in between each jump. That jump gives you just enough time to charge up your slice. There are some places where that dash is really useful. On a Goldie Seek, you can keep pace with that Goldie, and every single one of the slices releases an egg. Our third cooking utensil is the Blaster. The Blaster does a really good job at painting mid walls, so it might be helpful at the start of the match to focus on the left side of the map. And then when you're in the match, remember to not linger too much. This weapon has some really good potential to take out bosses and lessers. And if you linger for too long, you're likely to have something creep up on you. And so it's always helpful with this weapon to think about where you're going to get hit by the Salmonids, and which way would be better if you just sit there and took the damage. Swim jumping always helps with this weapon too, not just for getting a little extra range, but for getting some extra distance between you and some of those lessers. Our last cooking utensil is the Tent Umbrella. We can use our wall painting trick where we position ourselves slightly parallel to the wall, aiming diagonally at it. This will allow us to get a little bit more efficiency out of the Tent Umbrella. And we can use that same exact skill to paint all of the tower by slightly jumping off the edge whenever we fire. It's a little bit dangerous, but it might help you get a little bit more of this map painted. As I said before, every single weapon in this composition can take out fish sticks and stingers, but remember how dangerous it is to get there into the mix of it. And when you're trying to take out a fish stick, aim in the middle of their rotation, any way they can fit more enemies into the reticle of your blast. And you have three ways of attacking with the Brella. You can blast them, you can open up the Brella, and you can also send the Brella. Try to look for those moments where you can use these attacks in multiple ways. And just like the blaster, try not to linger without causing damage for too long. It's always helpful to clear up just a little bit more lessers, and you might get a little bit closer to one of those bosses to take it out. On an extra wave, since we don't have any weapons that have any incredible boss splatting ability, it'll help to combine attacks on the Kohozuna and the bosses. And if nobody's focusing on lessers, they'll take you over. An extra wave will probably need damage all the way across the map, so try not to linger anywhere for too long and keep the Kozuna in the middle, that way it's not too hard to take out these bosses. And just like normal, look for that moment at the beginning of the extra wave where you can activate your special to not just cause damage to the Kohozuna, but to also take out some bosses and spawn some golden eggs early on in the wave. And the fish fry usually comes up before the stage rotation, so if you want to catch these updates when they're hot and fresh, Make sure you subscribe and hit that bell. And if you want other Grizzco employees to receive these tips, make sure you like and share the video. Bye bye.